let's get going. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to, um, yeah, to start this newest iteration of the Conversations with Iris um, video, uh, video cast. Um, uh, my name is Catherine Craven. I'm a research fellow here at IRIS um, and I've been working on the uh, project Rebordering Britain and Britons after Brexit or MIGZEN for short. I'll, I'll put a link to the project in the description below later on. Um, the project that I'm working on basically looks at the impact of Brexit on migration. So that's uh, the impact of Brexit on people's migration experiences and strategies, but also migration governance going forward. Um, and one dimension that I'm particularly interested in is basically how Brexit has had an impact on transnational community formation and political mobilization. So, for example, the way that Britons living in the <laughs> EU and um, EU citizens living in the UK have sort of come together um, lobbying uh, for example, during the withdrawal ag agreement negotiations uh, together and, and fostering this European citizen identity. So um, I'm very excited that I get to spend some time today in conversation with uh, Professor Ashwini Vasantakuma, who has recently published a book with Oxford University Press titled The Ethics of Exile, A Political Theory of Diaspora. And the empirical focus of her book is very much this transnational political engagement and activism of migrant communities, or more specifically exiles, as we'll hear more about, uh, in their countries of origin. So I really look forward to talking uh, more about this. Um, Ashwini is an associate professor um, and Queen's National Scholar in Legal and Political Philosophy at Queen's University in Canada. She holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard, a master's from the University of Toronto, a Juris Doctor from Yale Law School and a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford, uh, where she studied as a Canadian Rhodes Scholar. Ashwini has also worked at King's College London, the University of York, the University of College Oxford and has been a researcher at the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm. Currently, uh, Ashwini is a visiting fellow in the Centre for Fundamental Rights at the Hertie School in Berlin. And on top of all of that, uh, I've also gotten to know her as a really funny, warm and very generous colleague. Um, so welcome Ashwini and thanks for taking the time to have this conversation with us. Yeah, so maybe to start us out, you could um, tell us about basically what the main argument or the main thrust of this book is and perhaps um, explain to our audience what you mean by uh, the concept exile. Great. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for having me um, and for that really wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to ensure that I'm only ever introduced in that way. Um, so it's just, it's really lovely to um, discuss my work with you because we have such sort of overlapping interests, um, but we also approach them, I think, from different uh, methodological approaches. So I'll um, say a bit about the book. Um, the book is a work in political philosophy. And um, like you, my research is looking at transnational communities and transnational politics in particular. And what I'm doing in the book is really sort of bringing a normative lens to thinking about transnational politics. So the book tries to make, or tries to sort of show, I think, um, two features of exile politics. The first is to argue that exiles have rights and responsibilities in the communities that they've left. So we often think of what duties do we owe to exiles, but I'm interested in thinking about the duties and sort of rights that exiles have in the communities that they've left. Um, and then thinking about the different roles that exiles play in homeland politics and the sort of functions that those roles can perform. And I, I focus on sort of two functions. One is that exile politics can sort of compensate for um, or remedy defective political institutions back home, um, but also that exile politics can play um, a similar role in international politics. So it exiles provide a linchpin, but I think also a buffer between communities back home and international actors who might be seeking to intervene or to provide assistance of some kind. Um, so I should say what I what I mean by exile. Um, 
So I define exiles as those who are territorially absent from their homeland. Um, and the homeland could be a state, it could be a community or a space within a state. Um, so often there'll be sort of subnational communities um, that would really be the focus, I think, of exiles politics. Um, so the first is territorially absent from that place. Um, the second is that they're compelled to leave, usually by sort of political reasons. And I think how we define politics and you know, what does it mean to be um, forced to leave for reasons of say political failure is, is going to be an area of debate. But I think because I'm interested in thinking about the ways that exiles repair politics back home, I'm really interested in those who are forced to flee because of political failure of some sort. Um, and then finally, um, exiles retain an identification with the homeland. So I think many times people might flee and they won't have a sense that they still are political members or that they politically identify with the homeland. Um, it'll just be a place where they will say born and raised and it's just now not, it doesn't sort of play the same role in their lives. Um, so I sort of think of that as a certain orientation towards the homeland. Um, so it does mean that not everyone who's forced to flee is going to be an exile, because I think some people are forced to flee and really don't look back in the same way. Um, but I'm interested in those who are away from their sort of political communities of origin, but still see themselves as belonging there in some way. So those are the sort of the three elements broadly of the definition. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering whether we could take maybe a little or step back or, or uh, zoom out again and think about how um, this story that you tell in the book um, answers sort of a need to tell a, a certain migration story, right? So um, rather than, and I think you, you, yeah, you illustrate this in the book, um, this narrative that's kind of dominant and in, uh, in refugee um, studies that that people who've been forced to flee their homelands are often agency-less uh, victims. Would you mind, um, yeah, explaining a little bit where you're coming from there? Um, yeah, great. So I think I think you. You sort of articulated it really brilliantly. I think part of what drives the project um, is, is just trying to sort of tell another side of the migration story. So I think um, certainly in, in the sort of discipline that I work in, in political philosophy, um, there's a real focus on sort of the ethics of immigration, right? And so thinking about like, who is a refugee and what do we owe them, right? And the assumption I think is really interesting that that we are, you know, so, so we are obviously in a position to be discharging duties to refugees. We're not the refugees or, right? But I think this is partly because of, of where a lot of political philosophy and just where a lot of scholarship gets produced and, and gets attended to. Um, so I think there's a real focus on, you know, what are the rights to enter societies? What are the duties? once people enter. And I think those are really important questions. I mean, we just, you know, there's, you just need to open the newspaper any given day and you just know that this is a really pressing question. Um, but I, I just think there are sort of these other sides to it, right? I think um, that migrants, um, their questions aren't only where can I go, but also what kinds of politics can I engage in back home? Um, and I think, I think the, I think it's just important to think of um, migrants as agents, but I think also as sort of really important political agents, right? Um, and I think that's why I sort of deliberately use the phrase or the term exile, because I think we just often think of, oh, the, the migrants or the refugees today are sort of just a, a mass of misery, right? Um, and exiles are sort of brilliant and we, you know, we attribute great sort of literary qualities to exiles. And it was just important to me to think that, well, actually a lot of the communities that we think of as just immigrant communities are actually engaged in the same kind of um, important political and sort of intellectual work as well. Great, um, thank you. Uh, that's actually a great, um, yeah, really, 
good way to move over to my other question that sort of has been burning on my mind. Um, this question of, you know, thinking about what, uh, what do we owe them and, um, and what do states in which large exile communities are living uh, owe to these uh, communities and then in particular I was thinking you know for example if we're talking about exiles like the the Tamil diaspora uh, well, exiles that are part of the broader Tamil uh, community which are also part of my thesis research and they exist in, in large part or live in, in countries like the UK um, that have you know complex colonial entanglements to put it lightly um, with with Sri Lanka the the country from which they've they fled. So what do, you know, former colonial powers owe to these people? So my, my question really is, and, and um, uh, I hope you don't mind me asking, but what do you think the role of, of exile communities can or must be in decolonization processes? So I think that one of the sort of important functions of exile politics is actually that they can interrupt or sort of correct what I see as an asymmetric relationship between powerful states abroad and communities that are sort of facing different forms of political crisis, right? And it's not a coincidence that many of those societies happen to be former colonies, right? And that many of the states that are powerful in the world today happen to be former um, colonial powers. So, so I see, <clears throat> sorry, I think, so, so decolonization is a, is a big term and, and, and so I'm not, I, I, you know, I, I can't claim to be an expert on, on how to think about the term decolonization, but I do think exile politics ensures or can ensure that sort of international politics is more, um, is, is, can be more equal, right? And so by no means do they make it equal, but I think they correct some of the inequalities. So um, exile communities, and I think, you know, the Tamil diaspora is, a, is an interesting case. Um, I, I'm not sure that globally many powers would have been interested in assisting, supporting a peace process in Sri Lanka, et cetera, because it wouldn't have really, it didn't really have the sort of geopolitical strategic interest that, that might drive those kinds of decisions. I think a really vocal exile community can shift that a little bit, right? Um, I think, and in the book I discuss um, Chileans who fled the Pinochet regime. And I think, yeah, you know, they, they sort of um, even held Sort of Western governments to account, right? So, um, so not only were they challenging authoritarian regimes back home, but they were also challenging, for example, the conservative government in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. right? That was eager to um, to to sort of like restore relations, right? Um, <clears throat> so, I think in that way, there is a sort of informal mechanism or a sort of politics from below that I think can challenge what are sort of really unequal structures of international politics um, that is a sort of direct, or you might even just say a continuation of colonialism in many respects. But yeah, like you were, you know, like you were saying, the, um, the you know, exile communities, they exist um, in really challenging environments and, and there is co-optation from, um, from all sides, from you know, private private actors, state actors, global governance actors uh, like the like the World Bank, but also um, the UN Human Rights Council, um, and yeah, my you know my thesis sort of was interested in um, examining and theorizing in particular these these um, actors in the international or global uh, political sphere that would trying to engage um sometimes to the point of you know repression um mm. or sometimes co-optation into like the global um political capitalist uh, economy so i you know i my um 
my perspective on, I guess, diaspora politics and diaspora engagement and strategies that states and non-state actors have to um, govern uh, or discipline diaspora population is that it leaves little space um, for agency. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the the main thrust, but then actually the you know the argument that I that I make in in my thesis, and and that you know why it's also been so um, generative for me to read this book is that in you know this seemingly um, all powerful uh, all these structures of dom domination there are there is resistance and there are um, people who've gone through so much and yet find it within themselves to um yeah to get out of bed every morning and and hold you know governments and powerful actors um to account so i you know i i i veer between um both sides but looking really on the ground shows you that it's always complex and entangled and the way that um, the resistance hap happens also shapes um, shapes the governance structures, so to speak. So, you know, there are now um, members of exile communities working for the World Bank and working for the UNHRC. So these distinctions actually don't don't make that much sense anymore. Um, oh. But yeah, I, I suppose my, you know, my question is on and this is going more maybe into the empirical um, discussion and, you know, what your your actual research process was like and you know how hopeful are you beyond the you know theorizing that there is the space for agency and these are the ways in which um communities or individuals can engage um yeah what do you see as possible <laughs> where does um, your hope come from no that's a great that's such a great question and and you know i think um, I think exiles and I, you know, I think any <clears throat> political actors who are, um, who are marginalized have to sort of navigate this really, and it's a really delicate navigation, right? Because, um, you have to maneuver within, within unequal structures without being co-opted by those structures. And I think that's just really difficult, right? Um, and I think no small amount of luck is involved, right? So I think when you, so one, one of the things that I just like found really fascinating in research is just um, the, you know, sometimes it's just um, sort of fortunate timing. Um, so there's a political crisis back home, which most people in the world aren't going to care about. But then like the perpetrator of that crisis annoys some powerful actor and then suddenly, right, people are willing to jump on your bandwagon. Yeah. Um, and so I think, and I, you know, I think one thing that um, is, is really, and you will probably sort of know this better because I think you did really sort of grounded empirical research is how can he exile actors are, right? So they're aware of the fact that um, you have to flatter, right? The Canadian politician by saying something about like how great Canada is and multiculturalism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they're sort of aware of the fact that they are, um, that they're playing a role, right? And I, so I just think there's, there's um, you know, the, the question between like structure and agency is just a, is a difficult <laughs> one, but I do yeah. think it's really, um, it's really fascinating to see how political actors navigate these. And I think how thoughtful people are, right, um, mm -hmm. about this and sort of how aware of the fact they are. Okay, we, we're just going to have to flatter this person who's only just using us because, you know, he wants our vote, right? So I think, I think there's, um, I, I don't know that there's a lot of naivety and, and there, that's, you know, it's just sometimes sort of really um, impressive, like the kind of political skills mm -hmm. that, um, that, that organizations have. Um, I think, you know, I think probably in the book, because I'm so focused on, in a sense, excavating this idea that exiles and, and diasporas more generally are sort of political agents, right? As opposed to resources mm. to be used by other actors, right? So I, I think it's really fascinating, like you mentioned that the World Bank 
is like diasporas are this amazing resource, right? Um, and I think even some um, scholars who work on sort of refugee and migration issues are really keen to sort of, um, in a sense, like advertise refugees as like great resources, right? Like they're great for your economy. Um, they're great for the economy back home. But I think it's really important that we think of exiles not as um, resources in the political plans that powerful actors have made, but actually as a sort of authors of those political plans, right? Um, so in terms of, you know, hope, I, you know, I mean, uh, when somebody has an answer to that question, I would love to know what it is. Um, you know, one thing I think is, is just really humbling um, and, and you sort of alluded to this, is just the sort of resilience of a lot of these individuals and communities and their sort of stubbornness, right? Their sort of sheer stubbornness. Um, and I think part of what I, what got me interested in, in thinking about this is that, you know, they see themselves as responding to really important moral claims, right? Um, I think it's really easy to dismiss exile politics as, um, you know, the kind of interference from armchair revolutionaries um, or sort of people who are just settling a grudge, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I think these are um, people who have survived enormous suffering and continue to be affected by the experience that they've had, um, but are really sort of see themselves as important moral agents, and I think are important moral and political agents. And I think change happens in unexpected ways. So I don't think that we can decide beforehand that a political struggle is, is too impossible, right? Like a government or a regime that was so powerful can just be toppled, right? Um, so, I mean, I'm hopeful in the sense that I'm hopeful about politics in general, but I also think there isn't, there isn't any point in despairing. No. Thank you. Yeah, God, I, I, there's so much in there that I, <laughs> um, I thought so much about, and like one one thing being the importance also of of precedent um, and the the amount of hope that knowing about and learning and reading about the success of the um, Chilean exile regime gives to other groups and how they emulate and build on um, and educate themselves about history and about you know, preceding resistance struggles um, is, you know, was just, I saw that all the time during, during my own field work. The one thing that you just talked about that really um, struck me also during my field work is that the things that you write about are not, they're not implicit and the excavation actually doesn't have to go so deep because the, um, these complex moral dilemmas that you write about you know um when is one uh when do, is one required when is it a duty to act out of solidarity or one when is one the object of solidarity it's mm -hmm. it's 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 front and center in the debate explicitly um within exile communities and often I found and this brings me to, I think to my like final empirical question um obviously diaspora and exile communities are not homogenous and there's a lot of literature in especially social movement studies about sort of you know intra exile or diaspora factions um and and struggles and you know sometimes it's helpful to point these out and some sometimes right. um not so much but i found that a lot of these um conflicts which are also super important and super generative are exactly um but the fault lines are sometimes over whether a group or a, a, a sub community sees itself more on the spectrum of the of the victim or the solidary agent if that makes sense and that could, that spectrum even exists within a single human being in a way oh my i guess my question was um I suppose this study could have also rested on a single really in-depth case study mm -hmm. because it's all there in each of these groups. So maybe you could talk us through, 
you know, uh, whatever <laughs> what I just said speaks to you and, and, and why you chose to um, use different case studies to illustrate different um, roles. Um, great. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think the conflicts within communities is often sort of dismissed as, oh, you know, they're, they're just always arguing amongst themselves, right? And I think there are all of these um, sort of caricatures of immigrant politics. Um, and, and actually, I think a lot of the conflict is really principled. It's because um, people are responding to different moral reasons. They think that they should be playing different political roles. Um, and they have different practical judgments about what will be most effective, right? So, so they're actually just the kinds of disagreements and conflicts that we think are really important in a robust and healthy democratic political community. Um, and I think they're, I think they're sort of replicated um, in in exile communities um, as they are in in lots of different communities and movements. Um, and so I think. You know, I think you're right. If I had um, d like spent done one case study, um, I would have been able to, in a sense, illustrate these and even sort of, I think, evoke the personalities involved um, in a different way. But but I did just pick different case studies um, that I thought really raised and illustrated different kinds of aspects of exile politics. So I think the Chilean example for me really. Um, made vivid the, the way in which exile politics can seem very localized, but it can actually have really important sort of global ramifications. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, uh, this was wonderful. And I think actually we kind of, even though we could probably speak for much longer, we can maybe try to wrap it up. Um, and maybe a question that you could uh, answer for us at the end is, is or two questions, I guess. Um, what do you think uh, migration and diaspora scholars should be sort of turning their attention to? And and what are you? Uh, what are you doing next? What's um, uh, what's your current and, and future work looking like? And where might we follow it? <laughs> um, great, thanks. Um, so I I think I would say that political theory should attend more to the work of diaspora and migration scholars, because I think, um, I think that enormous and rich body of literature really sort of illustrates different ways of political belonging, different ways that um, political communities are formed and sustained um, in ways that I think really, um, challenge the way a lot of theoretical work um, assumes these to be, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> um, and I think um, methodological nationalism has been challenged in a lot of disciplines, like history, et cetera, and it's not clear that it has been challenged as much in political theory. Like I think in lots of ways, political theory is a theory about the state um, and for the state and from the perspective of the state. And um, I think it's really valuable to see migrants not as marginal figures that, you know, that, that we need to categorize somewhere. We, like we need to put them in a state, right? Um, but actually thinking that they provide a perspective um, that really challenges our sort of assumptions about, you know, what is a political community and who belongs? Um, and what does belonging entail? Um, so I, I don't know that I have any advice for diaspora and migration scholars. My advice would be actually that I think political theory could be really enriched um, if if we attended more carefully, I think, to the really, you know, the really just thoughtful and detailed work. Um, and I think methodologically as well, the idea that um, migrants aren't objects of study, um, but actually really important political subjects that that we might learn from. Um, I think would be just a really good thing to keep in mind. Um, this isn't to sort of, I think, have an excessive celebration of migrant agency, because I think actually the problem in our world right now is that lots of people don't have the capacity to exercise mm -hmm. agency. Um, but I think it's just important, certainly as scholars and thinkers, um, that we that we learn we learn certain kinds of lessons, I think, um, by thinking with 
right? Rather than about um, migrants and other marginalized figures. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashwin. And this has been really wonderful. Thank you so right. much, Catherine, thank for engaging you. with my work in such a sort of generous and, and enthusiastic way. It's been really, it's, it, yeah, it's been really gratifying. Good, I'm glad. I look forward to um, actually meeting in person and <laughs> having much longer discussions.